In this video, I will be looking at, firstly, the differences between RAM bandwidth, latency, and transfer rates. In the second part of the video, I will be looking at the ever-present memory bottlenecks in today's CPUs. So let's dive right into memory bandwidth. Memory bandwidth is how much data is theoretically possible to transfer through the memory interface of a system. It's usually measured in gigabytes per second, gigabits per second, or sometimes, though technically incorrect, in mega transfers per second, although I'll talk about that in a bit. Firstly, the transfer rate is how many transfers per second the memory is operating at. This is only related to the memory clock speed and not the latency, nor the transfer width. Secondly, the memory bandwidth is the product of the memory transfer rate and the width of the memory interface. To keep it simple, we will use the units of gigabits per second. Now let's look at modern RAM used in today's PCs, DDR. DDR stands for double data rate. What that means is that the memory transfer rate is operating at twice the memory clock speed, hence double data rate. How it works is the memory makes one data transfer on the rising edge of the clock signal and one on the falling edge of the clock signal. Two transfers at a lower clock speed allow for lower quality memory interfaces and motherboard traces which makes PCBs cheaper to produce. So what's the memory bandwidth of a modern DDR4? Well, let's find out. Let's say we have some modern DDR4 RAM running at 3200 MHz. Well, that's wrong because you're never ever going to get DDR4 running at 3200 MHz. It's running at 1600 MHz, which means 3200 mega transfers per second. Now we know how many transfers are happening per second. We need to know how big one transfer is. On DDR, one transfer is 8 bytes wide, that's 64 bits wide, but we're running dual channel memory aren't we, because everyone does in these days, so one transfer across our entire memory interface is actually twice as wide, it's 128 bits wide. So if we have 128 bits being transferred 3200 million times per second, we have 409.6 gigabits per second transfer rate. Now 1 byte is 8 bits, so that's a memory bandwidth of 51.2 gigabytes per second. Although remember, that's the theoretical maximum. If you use ADA64's memory benchmark, you can see using 3200 mega transfers per second memory, we'll have a real world memory bandwidth of 47.6 gigabytes per second. That means we are seeing 93% of the theoretical maximum bandwidth that the memory interface can provide, and maybe we're not getting the full width for other reasons. I don't want to talk about the Infinity Fabric now, but as it runs at the memory clock speed and is 256 bits wide, it's very likely that it has the exact same bandwidth of the memory interface itself. Therefore, maybe the reason we don't get that last 7% of bandwidth is because our programs are running on a core looking at the memory through the Infinity Fabric, which is also utilised by other components on the uncore, which are taking up that other 7% bandwidth, which in this case is only 3.6 gigabytes, so it isn't all that much. Lastly, I want to talk about memory latency. When you look at the side of a memory stick, it will typically have a few numbers and letters on the side. If it says PC, then the following four digit numbers is its transfer rate. Also, if there is a single digit number after the PC, then that's the DDR revision. In this example, it's DDR2. Now the numbers that come after that are latencies. It may just say a string of numbers, or it might say something like CL or CAS. What this means is the CAS latency which is actually just the first number. The next numbers have other acronyms, but people generally just ignore those and quote the numbers. For example, I might say my memory is running at CAS 16, 18, 18, 35 at 3200 megatransfers per second. Not that I recommend higher memory speeds like that for Ryzen, although I'll talk about that in another video. Anyway, what these latency numbers are, are the relative latencies. That means I'm not quoting the time delays here, but it's the number of clock cycles required. For example, CAS latency, or column address strobe, this is the number of clock cycles from when the read signal, called the column address strobe, and the address to be read from are registered in the memory module to when the data from a column in the RAM chip's first bit of data is available. If my RAM module's CAS latency is 16 cycles and the chip is running at 3200 mega transfers per second, the absolute latency is 10 nanoseconds. So why does AIDA64 say I have memory access latency of about 81 nanoseconds? Well, the answer is quite complex. Again, remember that this is going through the Infinity Fabric, which adds latency. It's going through the memory controllers, and they add latency. But there are also other latencies to look at. The next latency is TRCD, or RAS to CAS delay. 
This is how many cycles after selecting a row that we can access a column in that row. If there were no previously selected, then the total access time is trcd plus cast times. The third latency is the trp, or the row precharge time. After a row has been selected, this is how many cycles it will take before being able to select another row. The last type of primary timing is the TRAS timing, or row active time. This is the number of clock cycles in which we can guarantee that the data has been correctly read from the memory. Think this is an access time window. These timings are all primary timings, but there are more called secondary timings. Lots more. I'm not going to cover them here though. Now using my machine, I'm going to have a look at all this. Firstly, let's look at my memory. I'm running it at 2800 megatransfers per second at latencies 14, 14, 14, 26 and it's SK Hynix memory and I've had no issues with it running at 3200 megatransfers CAS16. I'm just saying because some people say SK Hynix RAM just doesn't go well with Ryzen. At 2800 megatransfers, dual channel memory will provide 44.8 gigabytes per second of bandwidth. If we use the AD64 memory bandwidth test, then we get about 43 gigabytes actually being used and only lost 2 gigabytes per second. What's interesting is the quoted latency is 82 nanoseconds, which is far from the 12 or so nanoseconds that we should see. The reason for this is the scale of the test. The latency here is really the latency of a sustained transfer. See, the size of the transfer matters, and also where the data in RAM also matters. It is randomly accessible, but it does work best if accessed serially, although I'm not getting into how RAM works now, but essentially, when memory is accessed, it doesn't actually get read from the DRAM cells. The whole column is written into an SRAM cache, which is then read from. This means that reading from one column is fastest, as though DRAM doesn't have to be accessed again. Once data is needed from the DRAM cells, we have to wait for the data to be accessed, and thus incurs a time penalty. This is shown on the user benchmarks memory test, which is more detailed, and shows memory accesses of different sizes. The larger memory requests have memory spread out too far to be fetched in one go, and hence take the maximum amount of time. However, the most interesting thing happens at the lower end of the graph. With the three smallest data transfers, all three of these smallest accesses took pretty consistently 1.1 nanoseconds, which is 10 times faster than the fastest that my memory could respond. Never mind the latencies outside of the memory. So how did this occur? Well, if we go back to ID64, not looking at the memory, but instead at the L1 cache, it's no coincidence that the latencies are also 1.1 nanoseconds. I'm going to run the user benchmark again at a different clock, because the L1 cache runs at the core clock. If I change the core clock, and the lower memory access times match the new L1 cache latency, then that means that what happened was a branch prediction, branch target prediction, speculative execution engine and whatnot saw these memory accesses coming before they were even requested, and even correctly guessed the memory accesses to be made ahead of time. So when these accesses were made, the data was already sitting in cache. This is pretty exciting for me to have never actually seen this happen. Now that I've restarted my PC and lowered clocks to 3.5 GHz, which is the lowest that I can set or else the CPU just runs at stock speeds, you can see the L1 cache latency has increased to 1.2 nanoseconds, and the memory access times have also increased to 1.26 to 1.27 nanoseconds. Unfortunately, this test won't scale up anymore as data starts getting pulled from multiple cache hierarchies above this, causing odd access times that are between cache latencies. Anyway, this video is getting a bit long and more complex than it needed to be. In the second part, I will be looking at how memory bottlenecks are increasing in modern CPUs.